Hi everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com and supported by this amazing AI study tool called Wisdolia. At the end of this session, I would be providing you with the link for the practice session via Wisdolia so that you can, you can solve multiple choice questions and that will help you to understand the concepts much better. In continuation with this series on diabetes mellitus, this is the part 2 of this series where I will be discussing about glucose homeostasis. In my earlier session, I had talked about the general concepts of endocrine pancreas. We talked about the different cells of pancreas, the diagnostic criteria for diabetes mellitus and then the classification of diabetes. Right. So, in this part, we will understand what is glucose homeostasis. We will try to understand the insulin action and its signaling pathways and then end with understanding the concepts of or basics of pathogenesis of diabetes mellitus. So, what do you mean by glucose homeostasis? We all know that homeostasis is maintenance of constancy in the internal environment, right? In the context of glucose homeostasis, it means that maintenance of constant levels of glucose in the internal environment, right? So, this glucose homeostasis is very tightly regulated by three interrelated things which include one the production of glucose in the liver second one is the uptake of glucose and its utilization by the peripheral tissues the peripheral tissues when i say predominantly it is skeletal muscle tissue and thirdly the actions of insulin and the counter regulatory hormones including glucagon basically on glucose uptake and metabolism okay so this is what we need to understand the concepts of in the concept of glucose homeostasis so that let us see what happens in fasting state in the fasting state we know that the levels of insulin is low and glucagon levels are high which means there will be increase in hepatic gluconeogenesis there will be increase in, increase in glycogenolysis and then reduction in glycogen synthesis, which means to say that in the fasting state, there is a mechanism that will prevent hypoglycemia, right? And that's because of decreased insulin and increased glucagon levels. Whereas, once you consume the meal or after meal, what happens? The levels of insulin increases, the glucagon levels decreases, which means the increase in insulin level is important, you know, because it promotes glucose uptake and its utilization, right? And I said it utilization predominantly in the skeletal muscle, which means whatever glucose you take, it is taken up and then it is utilized so that prevents hyperglycemia which means on one hand during fasting we have mechanisms to prevent hypoglycemia whereas after meal we have mechanisms to prevent hyperglycemia so this is the concept of glucose homeostasis for that remember this hormone insulin is the most important hormone so now let us see how this insulin is synthesized right now, this is the illustration of pancreas. We know that these small areas are known as islets, right? And these are islets of Langerhans. And each of these islets is actually, you know, group of cells, which are, you know, we have studied that we have different types of cells, right? Alpha cells, beta cells, delta cells. The predominant ones are the beta cells of pancreas. These are beta cells of the islets. Now, let us see what happens in each of these beta cells. So, this is an enlarged version of the beta cell now once you consume meal see this glucose whatever you have from your meal is taken up by the beta cell through these transporters this is insulin independent glucose transporter irrespective of the insulin levels the glucose gains entry into the beta cell and then in the mitochondria the metabolism of glucose takes place which results in synthesis of ATP. Now, in the same beta cell, you have another channel which is ATP sensitive potassium channel. Now, normally what happens in this potassium channel is that the potassium goes outside of the cell, right? Now, because this is ATP sensitive potassium channel, the presence of ATP or increased levels of ATP results in blockage of these potassium channels, thereby 
potassium will not go out and then rather stays inside the cytoplasm. This results in formation of a depolarized state of the plasma membrane. Normally, once the potassium goes out, it results in hyperpolarization. But then because it stays inside, it results in membrane depolarization. Now, what is the effect of membrane depolarization? You have another channel, which is a calcium channel. This is voltage dependent channel. As soon as there is membrane depolarization, the calcium channel gets activated. The calcium gains entry into the cytoplasm. Now, once there is increased levels of calcium in the cytoplasm, what it does it does is, you know, the granules which contains, you know, precursors of hormone insulin, they are converted to insulin. So, that results in the conversion of insulin or synthesis of insulin. And this insulin comes out of the cell. So, this basically is the mechanism of insulin synthesis and secretion. What is that you need to know? You have the role of insulin independent glucose transporter. You have the role of ATP where the ATP sensitive potassium channel is inhibited resulting in membrane depolarization where calcium gains entry into cytoplasm which results in synthesis of insulin. Right Now, we need to know are there any hormones which are responsible for promoting insulin secretion from the pancreatic beta cells? Yes, there are and they are known as incretins. What are these incretins? Incretins are the hormones responsible for promoting insulin secretion from these beta cells. But these are secreted by the cells of the intestine which is after a food intake and the mechanism of of action of incretins is that it acts by binding the G protein coupled receptors that are, that are expressed on pancreatic beta cells. Right? And then you also need to know that there are two different types of incretins. One is glucose dependent insulinotrophic polypeptide, right? that is GIP. And second one is glucagon like peptide 1, which is called as GLP1. As soon as you have your food, there is elevation of GIP and GLP-1 and this is known as incretin effect. So, what it does, it results in increase in the secretion of insulin from the beta cells and it also results in decrease in glucagon from the pancreatic alpha cells. This is the role of incretin and incretin also delays gastric emptying which promotes satiety. Now, how are these incretins degraded? They are degraded by dipeptidyl peptidases, DPPs, especially the type DPP4. This is what you need to understand that there are degradation mechanisms for these incretins as well. Now, why do we need to understand about the incretin effect? The reason is that in case of type 2 diabetes mellitus, this incretin effect is blunted. Okay, there will be no elevation of GIP and GLP-1 in diabetes mellitus. So, there will be no you know, insulin secretion or decreased glucagon production. So, this concept is utilized in treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus where they use GLP-1 receptor agonists, DPP-4 inhibitors. You know, these are the ones normally which degrades these incretins, right? And these are the ones which are used to treat type 2 diabetes mellitus. This is the concept of using these GLP-1 receptor agonists and DPP-4 inhibitors. Now, once we understood the concept of insulin secretion, let us see how this secreted insulin acts. So, what is the action of insulin and signaling pathways? Now, we all know that insulin is the hormone which increases the rate of glucose transport into certain cells in the body, right? And thereby, it provides a major source of energy. And the intermediaries, you know, during the process of metabolism of glucose, they are used in the biosynthesis of various cellular blocks. What are the targets of insulin action? What are the cells which respond to insulin? There are three important targets. One is the skeletal muscle, two is the liver and three is adipose tissue. In the skeletal muscle, it causes increase in glucose uptake, increase in glycogen synthesis and also increase in protein synthesis. Whereas in the liver, there is increase in glycogen synthesis and lipogenesis and we need to note that it results in decrease in gluconeogenesis. Whereas in adipose tissue, it results in glucose uptake just like the skeletal muscle. It also increases lipogenesis but decreases lipolysis. Right? So, this is the mechanism of action of insulin on various tissues.
Now, when it comes to adipose tissue, I need to tell you two important things. One, we should know that there are two kinds of adipose tissue. One is beige adipose tissue. Another is white adipose tissue. So, this beige adipose tissue is the one which develops with exercise. Whereas, the white one is the one which accumulates in obese individuals. Right? So, this adipose tissue, the one which develops with exercise, is the one which utilizes most glucose. Whereas, there is not much utilization from the adipose tissue which accumulates in the obese individuals. So, this is important for us to understand that why exercise is beneficial. Exercise helps in utilization of glucose and obesity is detrimental to glucose control because it is the white adipose tissue which will not utilize the glucose, thereby resulting in increase in the glucose levels in the circulation and not being utilized by these adipose tissue, right? So, you need to understand the concepts of why we tell patients to do regular physical activity. Now let us understand the way insulin acts. So, this is a plasma membrane. Let us think that this is a muscle or an adipose tissue. In the plasma membrane, you have insulin receptors. It has two units, you know, alpha unit and beta subunit. That is the insulin. This beta subunit, you know, is the one which possesses the tyrosine kinase activity. Once the insulin, you know, binds to the insulin receptor, there is phosphorylation of the beta subunit of the insulin receptor, which helps in phosphorylation of other proteins called insulin receptor substrate proteins or IRS protein. So, there is hyperphosphorylation of these proteins, which in turn activates EI3K pathway. So, phosphatidyl inositol 3K pathway, which finally activates the serine or threonine kinase proteins. Now, what does that do? So, that results in recruitment of GLUT4, which helps in glucose intake. So, normally, this GLUT4 is seen within the vesicle. Because of action of, you know, this AKT, that results in recruitment of GLUT4 onto the plasma membrane, where it helps in glucose uptake. In the earlier phases, what we studied, after meal, there is insulin-independent glucose uptake. Whereas, this one is insulin-dependent. Because of insulin, there is expression of these receptors. There is expression of these channels where, you know, the glucose is taken up and then it gets into the cell. That, that is what results in increase in the glucose uptake. Second one is, it also helps in increase in glycogen synthesis because it inhibits glycogen synthase kinase 3 enzyme. The third one, it also inhibits function of forked box O, FOXO by phosphorylation, which results in decrease in glucose synthesis. Okay, one hand you have decreased glucose synthesis, another hand there is increased glucose uptake, right? And lastly, it also you know inhibits this tuberous sclerosis co complex, which increases protein synthesis via the mammalian or pathway, mTOR complex it is called. So, this basically is action of insulin on the target cell and the target cell is the skeletal muscle or the adipose tissue which we have described. What, what happens? Insulin results in increased glucose uptake, results in increase in glycogen synthesis, decreases glucose synthesis and also increases protein synthesis. So, this is the action of insulin on the target cell. Now, having understood the concepts of glucose homeostasis, concepts of insulin secretion and the concepts of insulin action, now let us understand some basic concepts of pathogenesis of diabetes mellitus. We know that there are two types, right? Two important types. One is type 1 DM and other is type 2 diabetes mellitus. Type 1 is an autoimmune disease where there is destruction of islets of pancreas because there are immune effector cells which react against our own beta cell antigens. So, there is autoimmune destruction. Of course, we know that we have studied in detail about the autoimmune diseases in my earlier sessions. There are genetic factors and environmental factors. Whereas type 2 is a complex disease, you know, there is no role or no evidence of autoimmune disease in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Of course, there is interplay of genetic factors, environmental factors, but it, there is also a pro-inflammatory state in type 2 diabetes mellitus. I will be telling in detail, I will be explaining in detail about the pathogenesis of both these entities in my next session. As of now, let's understand this basic concept. One is autoimmune disease, another is not, there is no evidence of autoimmune disease. 
So this completes today's session on glucose homeostasis. Now that you have listened to the session, I would suggest you to click on the link for the practice session. The advantage of doing so is that, you know, you can solve multiple choice questions. You can answer clinical scenario based questions. You do get instant feedback and I feel this is really fun to learn. If at all you like to subscribe, I suggest you do subscribe and you get an instant discount of 33% by using the code ILOWTHOLOGY33. So that's all for today. If you have liked the video, hit the like button. Do comment if you have any queries to ask. And if you feel this video useful, do consider subscribing and please do share. In the next session, let us learn in detail about the pathogenesis of diabetes. Bye-bye.